Okay. I think, all right, we're broadcasting. Um, it's a sh small group here. It's just Micah and I, and we're going to today talk a little bit about some of the social media um, and why we like certain aspects of it. And then really what I want to uh, make sure that I do is capture uh, some information we're going to talk about with um, Facebook pages. Micah's not a fan of Facebook, and actually I'm not a big fan of it um, in many aspects, but I think because of the large number of people on Facebook, businesses and golf courses and other people should understand how easy it is to set up a page. And I've set up many pages, Micah, but I am going to do this uh, on the fly, so it, it could be a total disaster. Um, but before we get started, uh, there's only two of us, but Micah, um, introduce yourself to the world. Yes. Uh I'm Micah Woods. I'm the chief scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center, and today I'm in Bangkok. And um, I've participated in a few of these chats before. Okay, good. Thanks. I appreciate you uh, coming into it. I know that you have a lot of experience <coughs> with <coughs> various social media aspects, so uh, it'll be good to hear your thoughts on some of it as we've already discussed. I'm John Kaminsky, and um, that's all I need to say. <laughs> uh, so Micah and I were discussing the use of social media, and I want to remind everybody that we are broadcasting live, and you can go to youtube.com slash turf diseases, or you can follow us on Twitter using the hashtag turf chat, and we'll be checking in with that as well and responding and answering any questions that you might have. If you're uh, thinking about coming into the Hangout, by all means do it. You can just go to the Turf Diseases page on uh, Google Plus and as long as you are a follower you should have an invite. So um, if you are following this uh, live or have access to Twitter, um, a shout out would be appreciated so I can know who's there if it's just Micah and I talking to each other, which it very well, <laughs> very well may be. All right, Micah, um, what I wanted to do is uh, basically we use Twitter uh, Google+, Plus, Facebook, obviously blogs. You have multiple blogs. I think you have your, your personal one and you have one for business. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And I run one uh, that we use just for the conference uh, that we do in Thailand. And then I also contribute to the Turf Diseases blog that you set up. So right. I write for, for various blogs, actually. Yeah, and I think that that's a big part of um, putting out the information there. And we're not going to really focus on blogs today because that's really a content-driven um, <laughs> venue or avenue. <coughs> Whereas Twitter and Facebook, a lot of those, they can be content, but they're also um, much more interactive than the, than the blogs are. So I'll get into it later, and we'll, I'm going to show some examples of Facebook pages, and we're going to uh, go through the building of one. I don't even know what we'll build, but we'll build one. Hopefully, um, no inappropriate photos pop up when I'm using my <laughs> Facebook page to to uh, to build it. But you never know what's going to happen in in live broadcasting. But so, Michael, why don't you tell me, um, similar to what you said earlier, the the ones you like and why you don't like certain ones, um, and then I'll kind of uh, discuss it as well. Mm, well, that's. Uh... I, I guess I like them all, but they all sort of serve a different purpose. And uh, for every person, that's going to be somewhat different. But uh, Facebook is great because it has so many people on it, and Twitter is great because it has so many people on it. Google Plus I like because we can control a little bit how the content goes out and who can see it. It's much easier to set that up with Google Plus than it is with, uh, with Facebook. But for me, the cool thing about social media is I love to write things and share information. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, I discovered that there was more snow mold damage where we'd applied potassium the previous year on an experiment that we'd done uh, in Ithaca, New York, when I was a grad student at Cornell University. So, you know, just this past weekend, I discovered, oh, it was March 24th, I think, when I'd taken a photo of that which was exactly 10 years ago. So I put that on my blog, and then I can share that on Twitter, share it on Facebook, share it on Google+. I wrote about it also on the, uh, the Turf Diseases blog, and then that gets shared on the various, various social media platforms, and then a lot more people see it. So I suppose that we get hundreds of people seeing it or thousands of people seeing it, where if, if we didn't share it on Facebook or Twitter or Google+, it's going to be a very limited uh, audience. So for me, it's awesome 
to be able to write things that I think are interesting, that I think people may care about, and certainly I care about it because I make the effort to write it, and then to have people be able to see it is really cool. Yeah, and I think that that goes to show the power of that because you posted that message on turf diseases, and then it went and hit the uh, Facebook page and Twitter and some other areas, and then all of a sudden on Twitter you guys got into a big discussion about it, um, about how little is out there or common knowledge related to for fertilizers and weed management. And so that's what spawned the Thursdays, Friday for you, Thursdays special um, turf chat, I think episode 23, where you're going to be talking about fertilizers and the impact on um, weed development and population. So, and I think Scott McElroy from Auburn is going to be in there, and Larry Stoll is going to be there, and uh, and I won't be there. <laughs> Maybe I'll be there, but I'm not sure yet. But um, so Twitter is my favorite as well. It's the one that I always tell people at conferences. I've been giving a lot of talks on social media, and I'm just like, look, if there's anything you get out of me speaking for two hours about social media, just sign up for a Twitter account, follow a few people, and then see how you like it and the interaction. And, um, Micah, you and I were talking before you had mentioned, you know, once you start following too many people, it gets, it gets so, so busy and so quick with the number of messages coming by that it's hard to, uh, keep up with it all and see everything. And so you really have to tag somebody or use a hashtag or do something to draw their attention and, and narrow down their focus. Um, and that's why I've been on a huge purge of my Twitter account. A, a month and a half ago, two months ago, I probably followed almost 2,000 people, and now I, I, I follow like 400 because um, they're the ones that are relevant to me, um, not so much turf, but just people that I like their information. And then I put everybody else in the list, and I follow those lists. So even though I might not be following certain golf course superintendents, I still follow them because then I just narrow it down using some other service like TweetDeck or something else. Um, so I think we both agree We both agree that Twitter is, is awesome, right? Yeah, you stumble across cool stuff. Like, uh, it, it turns out most of the PGA Tour events and even some of the international tournaments, the golf course superintendent will have a Twitter account and is posting pictures of how they're doing the tournament preparation. So right now, I think the... I'm not sure the tournament names, but the Houston Open's coming up this week, and there's somebody I've never met. I think his name's Randy. It's Redstone Super, I think, is the Twitter account. And he's posting awesome pictures of, uh, of the course and, and the tournament preparation. And last week at Bay Hill, uh, there, there were really cool pictures posted of, of the course. And then even other people in Orlando, when, when the storm went through, I saw – Lots of other pictures posted of what the damage was from the, the uh, debris coming down from the big storm. So there's so much cool stuff on Twitter that you can just stumble across. And uh, I, I, think, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I was just going to show you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you by sharing it, but you had mentioned Redstone Super, and then you know, you're on a computer, so you can immediately look it up. Um, and here's his Twitter page. Uh, he's a golf course. It's Randy uh, Sam Off. He's superintendent at Redstone Golf Club, um, home of, obviously, like you said, this week's uh, Shell Houston Open. And he's posting pictures, and here's he's talking about the attention to detail. That was just posted six minutes ago. And then we go to another one, and he's, you know, it's an hour ago, and he's saying the first frost is gone. So I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I had um, more people... Anytime there's a major event or a championship or tournament or something that I end up going to, I, I'm constantly tweeting out. So like every time I'm taking a picture of how they're changing cups or I'm taking a picture of, you know, what the crew is doing at any given moment. And it is, you know, a 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. behind the scenes look at what's going on in the tournament. And I get so much positive feedback from that. The Ryder Cup, I did it. Um, the Women's Open a couple years ago, I did it. I'm going to be at the Open um, at Congressional, I did it. And everybody was like, Oh, that's awesome. And it's not about taking like, you know, the best picture of the train of mowers going down the fairway. It's about just giving that inside look to people that don't get that inside look. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's what Twitter is so good for because you can actually post a lot of message and get a full conversation going. Um, you don't want to do that on Facebook. I mean, that's not really what Facebook is used for. You'll just really clutter up everybody's walls, which are already too busy because there's so many people. 
um, and mm -hmm. it's not really the intent of it. But I remember um, at Congressional posting pictures and just having a ton of people respond back and um, the USGA uh, now has a Twitter account and they're going to be pretty active at, um, at the uh, US Open this year at Marion. So I'm excited to see kind of how everything works behind the scenes. I think um, at Marion I'm actually going to have a press pass so I'm going to have my camera with me at all times and, and behind nice. the scenes. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so... I just, I just want to say one more thing, John, before you do your demonstration. And uh, that is, I, I do my work very international in so many different countries and uh, I have lots of friends uh, or followers on various social media accounts, whether that be Google+, Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Um, from from so many different countries and I end up being able to share information with people that I've never really met in person but then if they like the content uh, that I share through social media they we develop a, a communication they'll ask questions I can answer that and I actually get invited to speak at conferences or to write for magazines in Spain, in Florida, in Canada, in the Pacific Northwest, in Australia, uh, in China, through uh, just through social media. So it's a great way for people who want to share information to to uh, get that information out to a much broader audience. Yeah, I you know a few years ago when I made a conscious effort to increase. Um, international students in the two-year program at Penn State. Oh, hey, there's my cat. You see her in the corner? Somewhere around there, right? There. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when I tried to get more international students and make that effort, you know, I decided I was going to go to more places and just travel. And I found out it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be in terms of um, getting those opportunities, but a lot of it is exactly what you said. It's because I'm visible and I'll interact with people. So, you know, you don't have to interact with everybody via Twitter or Facebook, but I would much rather send a quick little comment back to somebody via Twitter than get an email that's going to take me a half hour to write and put all that information together. You know, on Twitter, you can direct them to somebody where you can say, hey, I'm not an expert in soils, but here's, you know, so-and-so's Twitter handle. Maybe they can address this for you. And the same thing happens for disease. Somebody might say, well, you should ask Kaminsky. And then I get it, and then I'm like, yeah, here's some resources for you. So it's a really easy way to reach a, on a personal level, reach a, uh, a large group of audience. Um, so, um, and then I just see that uh, Andrew Hardy, I see him in, uh, in Twitter listening. So um, he said that he, he's going to watch. He doesn't have much to add, so he's not going to come into the room. But uh, Andrew, welcome um, out there in Virtual and I world. think he just posted some cool pictures of the snow melting at his golf course and some uh, nice pigments he put down last uh, before the snow fell and some, some check plugs. So. Yeah, I actually asked him a question. and I don't know if you replied back. Uh, Andrew, if you're listening, I asked you on, the, on one of the various social medias, I asked you what it was that you put down because there was obviously a pigment effect and there were differences in uh, disease as well. Um, and you had mentioned something about plant health, but I, I wasn't sure exactly what it was that you put down. So reply back to us on Twitter and hashtag it turf chat so I see it. Um, okay, so we've been talking about Twitter a little time, but I, I really wanted to talk about Facebook pages. Um, and so what I'll do is I'm going to share um, a few examples. I'm going to screen share a few examples of, um, of some pages that... Let's see. I want to share my tabs. Okay, so this way I can bounce back and forth um, between the different pages. So um, basically a Facebook page, for people that don't know, is different than your personal profile. The number one problem that I see with people when they set up an account is they'll log in as, they'll create a new personal account and they'll call it like um, my lawn care business. And then to get people to like it or, or interact with it, you have to be friends with them. And that's like my number one pet peeve. Like if I get a friend request from a company or an entity, I'm like immediately decline it. And I usually will reply back and say, you know, this isn't what a friend request is for. You should 
set up a personal account and then set up a page for your business. So that's what a page is for. And so um, examples of pages, here's the uh, Penn State Turfgrass page and it has information and um, you know we can share stories. Um, this was something that somebody, I don't even know who because there's multiple managers on this, um, somebody shared the Superintendent's Magazine article about Augusta and um, and Marion, which Mike, I don't know if you saw, but it's pretty cool that uh, all three majors in the U.S. this year are hosted by Penn State alum. So I was I, excited about that. I heard that, and that's very impressive. Well it, done. That's cool. So, so anyway, you see the stuff that can be shared. Um, it's you know, there's sharing of articles, there's sharing of um, videos, there's direct um, information. We like to show a lot of pictures of around campus and. Um, for those of you in warm weather area, this is what campus looked like yesterday. Um, actually, this is a few days ago, it looks like. Uh, but we had another snow come, snow come by yesterday and dump another few inches on us. So it, it stinks around here right now. So um, unlike a personal Facebook page, anybody can see this information and anybody can like it or follow it or it depends what you have it set up as. Um, and you can see here we have... Uh, you know, 657 people that like it. So anytime we publish something out via this page, it should show up on their wall. Although it doesn't always happen because of Facebook metrics, but um, it should show up on their wall. We have this set up where our page is linked to Twitter. So as soon as we post something on our wall, it automatically goes to Twitter. And that's part of that integration that we always talk about because you don't want to have to post the same message in 10 spots you want them to automatically hit all of those spots. So here's um, the, that's the main Penn State page and then um, I also have one set up for the two-year program and um, and so I post a lot of pictures here related to projects that are going on. Um, uh, they had graduation uh, a couple weeks ago so that was probably the last time we posted anything and there's some of the guys with their uh, girlfriends and others. Um, big boardroom meeting project we did. So I was sharing this information live and there were people that were applying back um, that they had, you know, remembered doing it themselves. So anyway, that's a Facebook page. The primary difference is you should never set up a personal account as a, as a page. You should always um, set up your own personal account and then develop a page um, within the function of Facebook. And so to do that, it's pretty easy. I'm going to close a couple of these accounts out here. Um, here's Turf Diseases. I actually need to switch back to me because I was as Penn State. Um, I was going to give a shout out, shout out to uh, Rick Paget, the Penn State Golf Course. He does the same thing. He shares a lot of information so that the members can see it. So it's not only for education. Um, you know, golf courses can put this information down. They can show the progress of projects and, and other things that are going on. Similar to what we saw with Redstone. What's the um, one that we just looked at? Uh, the guy at the Shell Houston? Maybe at Redstone Super, I think. Yeah, Redstone Super. Similar to what he did on Twitter, he posted pictures. Well, one of the things that I like to do when I'm at a golf tournament is I have it set up that I can email a photo directly to my Facebook page or actually you can just upload it now using an app um, and that uploads to the Facebook page so people can see pictures but then it also goes out to Twitter so they get it in multiple spots so there's multiple ways to do it but setting up a page is easy um, basically um, all you gotta do is go to facebook.com slash pages and click create a page and that gets you started it's fairly easy to do. You just have to pick what you are. So if you're a local business, you can pick local business. If you're a company or an organization, um, you can do that. If you're an artist or a band. Um, John, if, if I'm a golf course superintendent and I want to set up a page for my like uh, golf course maintenance department, uh, what would you recommend? Um, I'm going to set it up as a company or an organization or institution because I like to say that really a golf course superintendent um, his maintenance facility is not a local business. That would be like the golf course itself, unless that also was, you know, an organization. Um, but local businesses would be like uh, Starbucks, um, you know, restaurants and retail. If you're a brand or a product, that would be more like, you know, I'm, I'm an iPad or I'm Mac or I'm, you know, I'm looking at the shoe 
news that they have up on display. You know, I'm thinking you know, like I'm Steve Madden or whatever it is. Something. What's that? You're a photographer. Yeah. So I think I have my photography page set up as an artist or brand um, band or public figure. I have it set up that way. Um, and, and you you can basically filter through these. And the nice thing is you don't have to be stuck with that. If you pick it and then set it up, you can change it at any time. Okay. But depending on which one you pick, they're going to give you different options in terms of um, the setup, in terms of the your about screen and the information that you're going to share. So I'm going to pick uh, a company or organization, and you see they have a bunch of different things up here. Um, I have no idea what to even pick. Um, I'll just call it a organization, and I'm going to call it XYZ Golf Course, right? So we're going to set up a golf course page. You got to agree to their terms, say get started, and it starts to process the information. Um, all right, so to do that, now you can upload images. That's pretty easy. You can do it from a website or from your computer, and that's simply just clicking on the image um, and finding where some images are and uploading it. So I don't even know what images I have, but here's one of a golf course that um, actually was a greenhouse I took when I was at Florida. So um, it's going to upload that image, and I'll say next, and it says uh, describe what you do. You know, you can just say I'm a golf course maintenance facility. Um, you can add your website link if you have one, um, and it says is it a real organization, a school, or government? And we'll say no, it's not. And you can skip any of these steps at any time and do it later. Um, but I want to kind of show you. Um, I'll just remove it. Um, so basically, that's it. That that sets you up. And then the nice thing about Facebook is they give you a little bit of um, direction, right? They say the first thing you should do if you're <laughs> you own the page, you know, you set it up from a personal account. You should probably like it if you want to, but you don't have to. If you don't want to be associated with this page, if you're putting a page together on something that's controversial and you don't want your personal account to be associated with it, you don't have to have it. So I'll say I'm not going to like this because it's a temporary page, but I'll skip it. Um, you can invite email contacts, so if you have your email people linked to it, um, whoever's in there, you can send them invites so they know about it. I typically don't do that right away because you want to build your page before you start inviting people to it. Um, you can say I'm going to share something, and so um, you know, you can post something on your timeline. I'll say my first post, and that's it. I mean, you're you're set up now with a page. And the key for this is that you have to, you know, continuously provide or post information. Um, I don't know why that didn't post. Sorry, I gotta I gotta decline that. <laughs> um, so it must have already posted, and I've got to refresh this. But um, so that's it. I mean, it's actually my first I found post. this. What's I that? I can find this already. So I yeah, just opened on Facebook. I can find it. Yeah, it's instantaneous. So I'm I mean, it's, like it. it's it's nice that you can have this up there um, really easily. And so there's other things you can do. You might want to add a cover photo, um, and that's unique to the. Um, Thing and I'll say I'll choose from photos that I uploaded. I'll just upload the same one and I save it. And so now I have I have the basis for my page. I've got um, my description. I've got my name of the page. I can like it if I want. I've got photos started already. And then after that, it's just a matter of posting information and getting people to like it. Now the nice thing about pages. Um, I think is that you can also see metrics with them. You can you can go behind the scenes, and th there won't be any metrics with this one, so we're not going to see anything. But if I go back to, I'll go back to uh, the two-year program uh, Facebook page, and you'll see here that we have a page built. It's just like what we just saw, but it's got different content. But I can show the admin panel, and what that'll do is that's going to pull up. Um, who likes our page? Uh, obviously, when we made some posts, there were increased traffic here because of those posts. And then we haven't posted anything in a while since graduation, and then traffic falls off. So you see what happens immediately if you're inactive on your page. Um, you can see which posts uh, 
you know, reached the most people. Um, here's one that it reached uh, almost over 1,300 people. Um, uh, we were doing some advertising with the page uh, a while ago, and so that's probably why we had some um, additional hits going on. But all you got to do is follow those few steps, add your photos, and then, you know, every once in a while post. Now, there's some things that are nice about Facebook pages, too. I mentioned it already. Um, one is there's a mobile app if you have iPhone, and I think it's available for Droid now. If you have um, an iPhone, you can basically um, download that app, and you can post directly to your pages. So, like, you can take a picture and post it right away from your phone. Um, the other option is you can upload it via email. So in your um, in your edit page section, you can see um, all the back end information of you know where uh, where you're located, um, what your category is, and I told you you could change this at any time. Um, and then you also and I won't go to it because it'll reveal some insight um, insider information. But if we go to like our admin roles. Uh, we can we can allow other people to post as the page. So if you have multiple employees, then you can give them all admin roles, and when they post, it'll come through as whatever the name of your page is. And you can toggle that off and on. Um, but you can also That's, get yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I I now that you're showing this, I realize that uh, Larry Stoll and I have a page on Facebook for MLSN uh, uh, soil nutrient. Uh, interpretation. For and are you an admin of that? And I'm an admin of that, so when I go to that I see the same type of thing. Right, so um, it's, it's a nice aspect of it. Um, you can manage the permissions of who can see it, um, you know, who can comment, you know, age limits, uh, language limits in terms of uh, expletives and curse words. Um, so you can do a lot with it and, and basically um, this the reason I became a, a believer in this in terms of the traffic and the numbers is that when we first launched turf diseases back in 2009 um, we were seeing a lot of traffic on our um, on our metrics in, in in Google Analytics but we weren't on face we weren't on Facebook and I was like I don't understand how come so many people I see that there's traffic, but I can't see where anyone's coming from. We only have like 500 likes on Twitter. Uh, we don't have barely anybody commenting on the blog. And so I started a Facebook page for turf diseases. Um, and you should be able to see when it was launched here because it should be a down. Yeah, so um, I changed that date to May 1st, 2009. We didn't actually, that's when turf diseases launched, but we didn't actually launch our Twitter page until probably a year later. But as soon as I did that, our numbers went through the roof because there are so many people on Facebook and so it really allowed us to reach out to a lot of people and you can see we've got almost 2500 people that uh, like the page and that follow it and um, and we can post information here um, I posted this link to the hangout that we're doing right now and you know within a few minutes it's got 171 people that saw the post because they're you know have Facebook open and sitting in front of their computer so it's it doesn't mean that they're going to react to that, but it means that they saw it. And so, um, so that's the general spiel as it relates to uh, Facebook pages and why I think that they're important. I have to agree with Micah. I don't use them. I use them in the sense that I still post content to them, but I don't use them in the sense that I track metrics and I try to see um, what posts are liked and what content. That For the purpose I use uh, Facebook, it's probably overkill for me. So, um, but I, I think it's important, and this is one thing that I, I preach a lot with the talks that I give, I think it's important to be on a lot of different networks, even if it's the same content, because, you know, Micah and I might like Twitter, but somebody else may not use Twitter at all. A lot of my students, they're not using Twitter, they're not, not that they're not fans of it, they just don't understand the purpose of it. Um, I think it's not until you're maybe 25, 26 that all of a sudden the increase in the use comes out. But they are on Facebook, and so I have to post things on Facebook. And at some point, there's going to be a new Facebook, and maybe that's Google+. Plus. But you know, you're going to have to put it on those locations as well. And and some of them offer some real advantages. Like we can't do these Hangouts like we're doing right now. We can't do that on Facebook. There's just not the option. 
So that's why Google Plus for this purpose is so good. Whereas Facebook, um, it's they have some other advantages in terms of the interaction with people. So um, hopefully people will at minimum if they watch this back they'll realize the, uh, the, at least the ease of getting it set up and you know you have to make a determination for yourself as to whether you want to use it or not use it um, but as an example if you're a golf course and you set up your page and you're like you know I don't really have time to post all this information you can make your assistants, um, your interns, you can make them uh, admins and simply with the app on their phone they can post directly to the page as the page. So they can be out in the field and they can see something going on like a deer running around or whatever and they can take a picture and post it up. And I, I hear a lot of people say, well yeah, I don't want my employees wasting their time on the phone all day um, doing stuff with the page. But it, it literally takes, I mean as long as, as much time as it takes to snap a picture and hit you know, post to page, it's probably like 30 seconds. And that content for your members is huge because they like to see what's going on. They want to know the behind the scenes um, aspects of the golf course. Just like they're sharing at um, Redstone Super at the Shell Open. I mean, we want to see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I think and, that's the interesting part. And recently in Japan, so many golf courses and golf course maintenance departments start to set up a Facebook page. And now everybody in Japan seems to be doing core airification and top dressing of their creeping bent grass grains. And it's so interesting to see that as it gets posted in different parts of Japan. You also see the cherry blossoms blooming on the trees in different parts of Japan on the golf courses. And you see the maintenance work that's being done uh, on hundreds of golf courses and you can learn so much. So for me the, the thing about social media is if you want to share information or if you want to consume information and learn, it's great. But if you don't care, don't get involved with it. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and, and that's fine. That's a good, good point. I mean, I, but I think um, from my standpoint, like you said, I learn so much because I get to see what's going on. I can't be in every place at every time, but with Facebook I can see what's going on in Maryland versus uh, Philadelphia versus Pittsburgh versus New York at any given time. Um, and so I think that there's advantages to it and I think sharing that information with your members is important. Um, I don't think that it needs to replace a blog. I think they can go hand in hand, but it could. I mean you could post, Facebook now allows you to post blog links, posts with photos and stuff. You could make this you know, a replacement of a blog, although I still like a blog. Um, but the, the reason that I say this information is important to share is because if you don't share some of these things. You're missing out on opportunities to influence or um, make your members aware of what is going on in the course. And the example that I use when I give talks is if you don't give um, any information to them about a main break that happened uh, at 5 a.m. and you fixed it, you fixed the problem before they even hit the seventh green, you know, or approach, um, they never saw that. They never saw all the work that you put into getting that. Um, solved and fixed so that they didn't have to see it. But that's a good post of pictures, you know, you know, when the main broke or the line broke to the work in progress to get it back together to the final product that they never even noticed um, before they got to the, the hole. So I think that you're missing out on opportunities. You're also missing out on opportunities to prevent that kind of phone game that goes where you know you tell a member something and then they tell somebody else a little different and by the time it gets back to you the stories are so crazy that you gotta then go back and explain yourself again having that information up on a site that you can direct them to with your words your specific um, description of what happened I think that, that that can save you a lot of time in the long run so uh, people look at it as a time suck and that they're gonna you know, waste a lot of time. It, it can be addictive and it can be a time suck, but if you learn to use it and you share the uh, responsibilities with some of your employees, I think it can be pretty, it can be pretty effective. So, um, I did want to, Micah, you have anything to add to that? No, that's, I've said everything I have to say, John, thank you. <laughs> um, I did want to bring up, uh, just because we're here and listening, um, Andrew said that they sprayed Civitas and Strata on the tees and Civitas and Strata Primo on the greens. Um, and straight Civitas on the fairways. And I wish he was in here because I wanted to ask him the differences between what happened. Um, I think Civitas by itself, um, from a snow mold standpoint, is kind of mediocre at best, but when you put it with a fungicide, it works. And 
I was curious if he saw any differences with the primo. He might reply back, but by the time we get back and forth, it'll be an offline conversation. So we'll, we'll continue the conversation offline. Um, but that's it. I don't want to uh, take any more time because we'll make it a quick, short one, and people can re reference back to this post if they want to know how to build a Facebook page. Uh, Micah, what I would say is uh, give your last thoughts and then um, maybe give a, pre a brief introduction in terms of what we're going to hear about Thursday night. Yeah, on Thursday night it's going to be awesome because uh, we're going to have another turf chat and this one is going to involve the differences in plant species that grow with different levels of nutrients in the soil. So if you put lots of potassium, you favor dandelion actually. If you have very low uh, potassium levels in the soil, we can have cool season grasses that thrive and we will find a complete absence of dandelion and possibly we could reduce or eliminate some herbicide applications. Now I think there's going to be some differing viewpoints discussed in the hangout and it's something that I'm really looking forward to and uh, it should be great. So I hope lots of people will join that one. John, what's the time on that? Uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, is awesome. The so I'll be back for that. You won't, but... Uh, I might try and join in. I'm going to have a computer where I'm going to be located and I might try and get in there, but I think I'm giving Larry Stoll access to the um, to get onto the Hangout as Turf Diseases so that we can make sure that it gets recorded and put up in the Turf Chat section. So either way, it will be recorded, and whether I'm in there or not um, really doesn't matter. I don't really have much to add to that conversation, but if I'm in there, um, I'd like to at least hear it live, but that's cool. It's, it's going to be good. Dr. Rossi and I, Dr. Frank Rossi from Cornell University, uh, and I wrote an article that was published in Green Section Record uh, in April of 2011, I believe. And I'll be posting some links to that article on Facebook and on my blog and on Twitter and on Google Plus uh, in advance of the Hangout so that people can read it because I think it would be useful to read before we have that discussion. But it's, uh, it's very clear based on some work that's been done, especially in England, that different fertilizers affect what plants grow in a, in a turf grass type of setting. Yeah. Well, they affect a lot of things. So the, the interesting part is, you know, whether people buy into it in terms of saying, hey, that's interesting. I have gaining lines, therefore I'm not going to do this. But then what else are you influencing in a positive or negative way? So like if that's your only pest problem or issue, then, then great, that might help you out. But then it's such a dynamic system that you know, going to an extreme on one side or the other you know, may end up... With it, we're going to talk in detail on Thursday evening, but it's obvious that adding lime and adding a complete fertilizer favor multiple species. If you add only nitrogen, you will reduce the species composition and you'll favor grasses. So it's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Um, and Andrew sent me a... Uh, message on Facebook uh, or on Twitter saying that he was in his office and he could join us now and um, I thought we'd take a couple minutes and maybe since we teased it a little bit let you talk about your uh, your pictures that you posted before on on Facebook I check to make sure your mics working can you hear me yep okay um well I, it's been pretty well documented by me of course that um, I, I did use a lot of Civitas last year, and uh, so I just sort of continued those over into my um, my in-house trials that I performed going into the winter last year. So, like I said, on greens I did spray the uh, the full rate of Instrada with a 12 ounce rate of Civitas, and then an uh, an eight mil rate. Sorry, I don't know what that converts to. Me either. Point point two five point two five ounces. And um, that was on greens. I, I wasn't gonna mess with uh, with my snow mold rate on greens. And then uh, on teas, I did the uh, I did the even number teas with uh, two hundred mils of Instrada, twelve ounces of Civitas. And then the uh, sorry, that was the even number of teas. And the odd number of teas I did at 250 mils with 10 ounces of Civitas. And then fairways I did uh, a majority of them with straight Civitas at the 14 ounce rate. 
And I did do some half and half comparisons with a product that's called, um, I guess it's called Trinity in the States. Yeah, Triticonazole. Triticonazole. Which is, for us at the uh, one ounce rate is the cheapest snow mold option available in Canada now. Now that um, Quintessine is not. And uh, I, everything's clean. Like right from greens right back to fairways. Like we had uh, some, I took some pictures that I posted on Twitter yesterday of some superficial snow mold on some fairways with the straight civitas. But I mean, the pictures make it look worse than it actually is. And the check plots, the check plots are snow mold free, but the uh, the quality of the color is just uh, is unbelievable. Yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the effect that you're getting in there is not necessarily the disease control out of it, but the spring color that you're getting is obviously based on your photos. Um, pretty good with uh, the product that had. The harmonizer in it. Yeah, the, the the pigment was definitely the difference maker. Everything here is absolutely glowing green right now. Your members are going to want to get out there too quick now because you've got everything looking green. Well, I mean, like part of the um, part of the conversations that I had with the people from Syngenta here in Canada because they're the, they're the distributor of it was that um, you're going to see a lot more recovery in the spring as well because there's something in the pigment that heats up and activates the plant faster. So I, I would say my fairway program is a result of using it all year last year because I just don't think that you can use it as a one-off and that's going to be that's going to be the silver bullet. And a lot of people have gotten themselves in trouble thinking that that's what they were going to do as well. Well, you definitely can't use. I mean, it's a it's an active it's a plant activator. So I mean, it's got to go out multiple applications ahead of time to get it, um, you know, activated in the plant. We've seen pretty good data with it um, under moderate pressure with Dollar Spot. Um, the color that's in there, I guess you guys like it. I, I'm so tired of all this pigment crap that's out there, but it it does make the turf look. Nicer. I mean, there's definitely. A, I mean, you showed those pictures. There's a huge difference um, between where the pigment was and where it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> but from a disease standpoint, we did see pretty good data with uh, on our putting green with Dollar Spot. And, but you you have to continue with the application. And then is that you, Andrew? I'm gonna mute you for a second. Um, you have to use it routinely. But the biggest challenge is you have to know when to back off. So if, if you start having turf loss or other issues and you keep spraying this, it just basically like gloms up the dead turf. So like if you have any kind of turf loss for whatever reason, you got to back off from using this stuff. Because um, it's my understanding that it has to do with the pigments that are in there in terms of what they do and they, they hang around on that turf. Um, and then it's, it's not growing anymore and so it just stays there. If you spray this stuff on rocks over the winter it, it doesn't go anywhere it stays there forever so um, or at least through the winter uh, so that's that's the biggest challenge um, you know I'm still not convinced it's a standalone product but I think that the added advantages of the induced systemic resistance with the color response because of the pigment um, it does look like a pretty a pretty decent option for people so it's funny, I'll have to take some pictures one day of some of the rocks around the putting green and some of the um, some of the cart paths where you actually drive off and you may get some dripping from a nozzle because the pigment isn't going anywhere. We've sent people out scrubbing them and it's not, it's pretty difficult to get it off. The sprayers were even hard to clean in the fall. But um, as for us, it fell within our threshold on fairways. Like we may have had five to ten percent breakthrough dollar spot on fairways, and that was enough for us to warrant not spraying for dollar spot last year on fairways. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, I don't know what the pressure's like up there um, during the season, but if you can avoid that, then I don't know what the cost benefit is because I don't know what the cost of Civitas is, but um, 
you know, obviously where you were located, the reduction in pesticides is a big issue. Um, and I guess it depends a lot on what the threshold is of the individual golf courses and whether they can handle that much pressure um, or they don't want to see it at all. So anyway, I didn't want to completely switch the topic up, but I know we were talking about this in the Hangout. You had posted some pictures. Um, remind everybody what your uh, Twitter handle is so if they want to go back and look at it, they can see it. My Twitter handle is at Pheasant Turf. P H E A S A N T T U R F. All right. one word. All right. Good. Uh, well, I appreciate you making it in. It looks like it's freaking cold there because you got that little snow hat on. You got your toque on and uh, and a jacket. It's uh, it's not that bad. The snow's starting to move now. Slowly but surely. Well, we just got another probably three or four inches yesterday, and it's driving everybody around here nuts. I mean, it's the end of March, and we are still have snow. It's unheard of for us. Well, so uh, so anyway. We were, um, we were actually open for a week, if, if, a week last year. Like, we would have been open a week now. Uh, uh, I thought you meant you opened sometime out. for a week this season already. I was like, holy crap. No, no. No, like, we, we opened on the 19th last year. Yeah, things are uh, things are definitely different um, this year. So it'll be interesting. We'll probably go from winter to summer and never have a spring, but it's typically the way things tend to happen. But um, anyway, thanks for joining joining us in here, uh, Andrew and Micah. As always, thank you. I appreciate the uh, the feedback from social media and kind of how you use it. I think it's important for people to understand that not everybody likes all social media. And when I talk about social media, there's some that I like better than others. Um, there's reasons why I use certain ones over others or why I use all of them together and integrate them. And so you just have to find a good fit for you. If I could give any advice to anybody, it would be sign up for Twitter and follow a few people and then see how you like it. And from there it expands into I don't want anything else other than this or I'm going to see what else is out there because I'm into it. And that, that's typically how it, it ends up going. So. Awesome. Well, please join us on Thursday night. and. Uh... We'll talk more about uh, fertilizers and weeds. Yeah, I think that's going to be good, and it's going to you know have a lot of science in it, so it'll be different than the social media stuff that we've been talking about. There's obviously going to be um, three PhD research people in the room um, with you and uh, Scott and Larry, and so there'll be a, lo a lot of good discussion and maybe some controversies from people, but it'll it'll be good. So. I'm looking forward to watching that on the rewatch if I don't make it in there, but um, that's it. So anybody have anything coming up they want to promote besides that? Nothing on my end. Just, uh, like I said, just watching snow melt every day and doing my thing. All right. I will say that uh, Thursday night at 5.30, that's the next Turf Chat. That's going to be episode 23 on the influence of fertilizers on weed. Uh, populations, I guess, not really weed control, but weed populations. And then the following Tuesday, we don't know what the topic's going to be yet, but I will be out in California with Larry Stoll at the Pace Turf Conference. I'll be speaking there on Monday. And then Larry and I are going to host uh, episode 24 of Turf Chat from his office. So if you've seen it in the past where he's sitting in his lab, um, this time it'll be both of us sitting there together doing this. So we should see how that goes. It should be interesting. So it's uh, it'll be much nicer weather than this. That's all I know, and that's what I'm looking forward to. So with that, uh, I'm signing off. Thanks for everybody uh, in the room and everybody out there listening, and we will see you later.